Welcome to the Better Together podcast, where we look for ways we can work together to advance the cause of Jesus Christ throughout the world. Today, we have with us Dr. Chuck Lawless. He is a professor at Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary. He also works with Church Answers. He's been very active in his writing and discipleship, and it's just an honor, uh, Dr. Lawless, to have you here with us today on the Better Together podcast. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm excited to be with you. I know that you're very concerned about people taking the gospel, sharing the gospel, and uh, and we've talked a little bit about how so many Americans in particular are not sharing their faith with other people. What do we know about that? Why do we think that so many Christians are keeping their faith to themselves? Yeah, let me let me say, first of all, why obviously why this is so important for me personally, uh, it was a 12-year-old classmate who led me to the Lord many, many years ago, a seventh grader who just loved me enough to tell me about Jesus and his passion marked my life. And what, and what I've learned since then is that uh, quite often what happens, we can talk about fear getting in the way of our doing evangelism. We're afraid of rejection, afraid of, of not knowing answers. And in most surveys I've seen, fear is the number one reason that people don't do evangelism. But I, th- I think there's a bigger issue, and that is that we believers, particularly the longer we're believers and the higher we go up in a leadership ladder in the church, the more likely it is that we become cocooned in the church world. We're in the bubble of Christianity, and we don't even know any lost people to be burdened about, and we don't share the gospel with lost people because we don't know them. So I'm, I come to faith. I'm a Christian. I'm going along. I get involved in a Sunday school class or life group. Uh, lo and behold, I could become an officer in the church. I'm doing all of these things at the church, maybe three or four times a week. I'm trying to do my best. And what you're saying is before you know it, I don't even know. Uh, I don't even, I'm not even thinking about my unsaved coworkers because I'm thinking about what I need to do at church. Is that kind of the way it works? That's that's exactly, you described it exactly the way it happens. And I would even argue, I would go so far as to argue, we so fill our calendars in the church and so expect every faithful member to be at every event. It's it's no wonder we don't have time to be with lost people. So I think this is a systemic problem in the church and the way we do church and certainly in the lives of I think from the pastor on down, it starts with the pastor. The pastor's in the bubble. The church will often be in the bubble. So we really need to think about that. And you've been thinking about the bubble for a long time. You've even written a book about it. Um, I'm sure in this book that will come out very soon, you have shared some ways to get out of the bubble. Yeah, the what book is, is called, Lord, I'm Caught in the Bubble, and uh, it will come out through Church Answers. Uh, the plan is for it to be a, a free ebook, so I'm excited that it will be available to everybody. I've, I've wrestled with this because, because of my own experience. I, I teach at Southeastern Seminary. I work with Church Answers. I also work with the International Mission Board of the Southern Baptist Convention, so all of my world is wrapped up in in believers, but I'm a professor of evangelism and missions. And so it, you can't you can't do both well. And so the Lord has just gripped me to say, you have got to figure out how to get back among non-believers. So let, let me just give a couple of ways and we can continue the, the conversation. I, I think, first of all, we just have to ask the Lord to help us see people as sheep without a shepherd that my neighbor is not just my neighbor. I have to wonder about my neighbor's soul. My coworker, my classmate, they're not just friends. This is a person in need of Jesus. And so we need the Lord to turn our hearts around to see people like he sees them. And then I think, honestly, we just have to stop and ask, all right, who are the people in my life who are already somehow connected to me who, as far as I know, aren't believers. It's not that I haven't been around them. It's that I haven't looked at them with eyes of evangelism. I've not been concerned about their spiritual condition. Uh, and so I need to I need to have the Lord rework my heart 
so I can begin to see people around me. That's good. So number one, it sounds like prayer. I just start out by praying and recognizing everyone around me is made in the image of the Lord. Everyone around me needs the gospel if they don't have it already. And it almost sounds like you're saying, as I'm praying about that, if I'm as I'm becoming observant, that I'm then starting to think about that, and that could lead to, to ways of sharing the gospel. Now, I want our listeners to think about, we have something called three for 30. We're trying in this decade to reach people with the gospel, train people in the faith, and give of ourselves to the Lord. And so we've got some helps at nafwb.org, that little bookmark on who am I reaching with the gospel? Sounds like what you're saying, Dr. Lawless, is I look around the classroom, I look around the workplace or the neighborhood, and I don't know if this person's a Christian. I might write their name down, and I'm praying for them daily, looking for opportunities to share the gospel with them. Yes. In fact, I, I encourage folks, we ought to be able to name, and these are arbitrary numbers, but I think we have to start somewhere. We ought to be able to name at least five non-believers for whom we're praying every day. So I start there. Then I want to I want to be able to name at least two people that I am I am seeking to develop a relationship with so that I can share the gospel with them. And, and I want to be able to name my one. Who's that one person whose spiritual condition just breaks my heart? And so in my prayers, I have five people I'm praying for, I may not be sharing with all of them yet, two that I'm really working towards sharing the gospel, and one, I've, I've gotten there, and I'm just, I'm trying to, in the power of the Spirit, lead this person to know Jesus. If, if we can't name these people, here's the way I put it, a nameless burden is no burden at all. Mm, that's great, yes. It's when you see a face, and you hear a voice, and you know a name. That's that's when the burden becomes real. And until we get there, uh, we're not even worried about being in the bubble. Uh, we need the Lord to, again, break us and turn us. And I do think that begins with prayer. Lord, Lord, take me in that direction. And they can be family members. They can be co-workers. They can be people that you meet in restaurants. I, I sense that you're you're getting at there across different levels. I, I sense you're also pushing us toward we're going to have to stretch a little bit to get out of this bubble. Yeah, you know, it's um, I've, I've got some relationships right now, some friends or non-believers. I go hang out with them. I don't I don't put myself in compromising situations, um, but I do hang out with them and they they talk differently than I talk. They think differently than I think they act differently than I act. Uh, they do things that I wouldn't do. Uh, and is there, a, is there some discomfort in that? If I'm honest, yeah, I'm, I'm much more comfortable just hanging around, hanging out around believers. But I can, I can learn how in the grace of God to hang out with people who don't know Jesus and learn how to love them and gain their trust. They might hear me when I, when I tell the story. Uh, but it is hard. It, it takes effort. It takes energy. It takes focus. It takes it takes prayer. And so you've really laid it out in this book um, about the bubble that people could get at churchanswers.com for free. And so really, we would encourage them to take a look at that, explore that, maybe study it a little bit as a church. And then are there things we need to change about the way we're doing things? And then individually, and I, do I need to be more uncomfortable? Because it is uncomfortable, isn't it? And try to step forward and try to do this, get out of the bubble. Yeah, I would say to pastors, just, just think practically about how do you get outside your office and get to know people who are unchurched? Um, I, I plan into our schedule. Uh, we need to plan into our schedule some time to be with non-believers. Um, and I think we need to tell our church that we're doing that. Mm -hmm. if, I, if I'm the pastor, 
and I'm spending every Thursday afternoon getting to know non-believers and trying to share the gospel with them. It's great that I'm doing that, but if my church doesn't know I'm doing it, I've lost an opportunity to model that for them. and I've lost the opportunity to get them to pray for me. So they pray, they hold me accountable, I model, I'm, I'm out in the community, I'm making sure I have lunch with somebody that I think is a non-believer, I'm getting to know government leaders in my city, I'm getting to know school board members, I'm just intentionally trying to build relationships. Uh, I, we, have a, we have a gym at our seminary, uh, I could easily work out at our gym, I don't do that, I work out at a, at a public gym, and I do that because that's one place where I can be among non-believers. Uh, we have to think that way. How do I get outside my routine? And, and you just heard the struggle there. We like our routine, but we're yeah. not going to win the world by our routine. And so that's kind of what's happened to us. And it's almost like we're checking off. Well, I've done this or I've done that. Uh, but we, the more we do certain things, the less lost people we interact with. Right. And you're saying, We've got to really think that through and be intentional about going out and uh, and trying to meet lost people and reach lost people. That's right. Even even inviting folks in our neighborhood into our backyard for a barbecue. Um, I'm I am I'm highly introverted. Uh, on Myers Briggs, I would go off the scale in introversion if if I could, um, but. I still have responsibility to get to know people and, and share the gospel with them. So you figure out ways to do it. For me, if we have, if we have, uh, I'm hanging out with a crowd somewhere, I may, I may not be the person that is going to be the, the, the life of the party, but I'll find somebody to talk to. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and if we can figure out, I invite a few of my neighbors into our backyard. We just hang out for a little bit. Uh, I want them to see, hear us. I want them to, recognize our our faith and i want to gain the privilege of sharing the gospel with them uh, yeah. but it's not going to happen unless we initiate it uh, folks don't just come to us we are called to go to them that's good and you know by the way introverts one-on-one -on -one, they can do that pretty well and us extroverts we have to struggle because it's sometimes it can be harder in that situation uh when there's not that many Christians around. Yeah, it's a good point. Good point. So we there's something coming down uh, perhaps in the future called the Hope Initiative. I think you're really at this point kind of taking the lead, taking that by the reins. Or is that something you're able to talk a little bit to our listeners about? Because that's a way of getting out of the bubble, uh, if you will, uh, in the future. Yeah, Hope Initiative, we're still in the beginning stages of it, still testing it. Uh, but one of the things we're looking at is, as we have done church consultations for decades now, uh, quite often what we've done is we've looked at the entire church and written a report. A report often lists, you got to work on this, you got to work on this, you got to work on this. And sometimes, honestly, the report is so overwhelming and discouraging that pastors don't even know where to start. What, what the Hope Initiative says is this. We're going to start by doing, by getting outside the walls of the church. We will still address issues that we see, but we're not going to wait to fix those things before we help turn people outwardly focused again. And so we're going to ask pastors to pick a, a certain number of people in their church and, and work with them for 30 days to, to pray, uh, to get out in the community, to get to know people, uh, to, to simply through that time, turn their eyes to the people that need to be reached. And we just believe that uh, one of the ways we can help churches get healthier is we get pastors taking the lead. And that's why pastors are critical here. Uh, we don't believe it's going to work if pastors aren't, aren't leading the way with passion. Uh, and then give me a handful of people uh, whose fire gets lit then I move the church in a positive direction, and we just believe that fire will continue to burn, particularly if the pastor does that for uh, one group and then another group and then another group over the course of a year. Uh, we're pretty excited about what we think can happen. It's an exciting, it's an exciting thing, and so often in the church consultation, you're trying to get all of the church on board, and there's some folks that don't want to accept the information. 
with this, you don't have to worry about any of that. You just eat a handful of people. And what I hear you saying is it, you build momentum. You get a few folks here, a few folks there, and then people start getting excited. And instead of trying to get everybody on board at once, a few folks here and there, and it sounds like uh, we're, we're hoping it leads to a, some momentum, right? And yes. the entire church down, down the road. Yeah, I think I think we got to rethink how we how we want to change churches. I, I tell my students, forget about changing your whole church uh, because you're never going to get there. Jesus had 12 disciples and one of those was a fake the entire time. Uh, he didn't get his immediate group all on board. So if we really think we're going to get everybody on board, we're not going to do better than Jesus did. Uh, and I actually I even say, look, if I can keep my ratio at one to 12, uh, I. I'll be all right because I can take those 11 and we can turn the world upside down. That's so right. I, I really do want us to think, Lord, I don't, I'm not asking you to change everybody. I'm asking you to give me a few. Uh, and all of us at every church, I don't care what size it is, even how much we struggle. Uh, there's a few. There, yeah. There's a remnant who want to see the Lord do something. And we just have to connect with them and in faith help light their fire. That's great. That's good. So we want to encourage our listeners to be thinking about that. Be thinking about these, these uh, projects, if you will. Check out the book. Uh, look for it for it on churchanswers.com. Shoot us an email if you're interested in, um, in the Hope Initiative or uh, maybe the Know Your Community. So we're partnering with Church Answers to produce that as well. And uh, many churches have done that to learn more about their community and places they can get out to. And we'll do our best to try to get you on the right track to help provide you with some tools to help you reach your community with the gospel. Dr. Lawless, thank you so much for joining us today, my friend. Thank you. It's been great to be with you. And we want to thank you for joining us. And so if you're listening for the first time, how about liking the page? If you don't mind, share the podcast with someone who might be interested. And remember, everything we do to advance the gospel of Christ, it really goes better when we work together. We're better together.